<laughs> when you're done. This meeting is being recorded. I am now letting people in. Okay. That's right. I had a momentarily panic because I hit something and I got another Zoom screen coming up and I couldn't see anybody. <laughs> <laughs> nope, I can see me in the middle screen now. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay, we think we're ready to start. I think we're good. Okay. Well, I would like to welcome and thank Dr. Michelle Fowler for coming to our con. Michelle is an amateur astronomer and a research scientist. She's the assistant director for science communications at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And from 1998 to 2009, she was staff scientist at the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center. That would have been interesting. And later she was the manager of the education and public outreach program for the Spitzer Space Telescope at the California Institute of Technology. She's frequently on camera. I've seen her many times. She explained <laughs> things well. And we're welcome to have you, uh, thankful to have you and welcome. Well, it's, it's great to be here. I know I was here last year and uh, you know, it's wonderful to be here with you all for the, 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 uh, the, the next hour. If you hear some thumping, don't, don't worry. I'm having uh, my, uh, my, my, my papers replaced on my uh, sidewalk. So don't worry about that. That's fine. <laughs> but uh, um, you know, I, I got some questions beforehand from some people that uh, you know, some of the topics they'd want to talk about. And I, and I prepared some slides about that. But this is informal. So I can, I can answer some of the questions that I got. But I'm also here just to discuss things with you. You know, talk about ideas. If you have some crazy idea you never really felt comfortable asking, that's exactly the type of stuff I love to hear about. So, um, and 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 just talking about anything you'd like. So, um, you know, feel free. If you know, if we can either I can either sort of show, sort of show you the slides I have and then go to questions. But if people want to jump in, I'll leave that to the the moderators. We can do questions later. But at any rate, um, it has been an incredible year at NASA. Um, I, I, I'm still, my head is still kind of spinning. I mean, to give you an idea, the, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, which was this, this big new space telescope, many years behind schedule, over budget, all of that. It's, a, it's actually a, a mission that my husband worked on. So that was very much part of the family. You know, both of us oh. lost a lot of sleep over this, uh, over this telescope yeah. in the last uh, decade or so. And uh, it's up, it's working wonderfully. And we are getting ready now. We're taking the science data right now for our big splash, you know, come down the grand staircase release uh, of our first beautiful images, which um, we're, we're, we're actually kind of arguing about the date because there, there are three space agencies involved. The, uh, it, it's a joint mission between us, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. And so the, uh, the main thing is we're trying to figure out, you know, who's doing press releases when and what. So we're, we're, we're getting that all worked out. But my guess is you're gonna see the first beautiful images July, middle of July. Uh, July 12th is where I think it's gonna be. So, um, but it has worked astoundingly well. And, um, but, but there's not just that going on. Um, other big things going on recently. Last week, we had the uh, release of the first ever image of the, uh, the, the big black hole in the middle of our galaxy. And that's a, a black hole that is over 4 million times the mass of our sun. And you are orbiting it right now. You are, well, I, you know, I mean, to put it technically, you know, correctly, you are actually freely falling towards this black hole right now. That's true. <laughs> what, uh, what, what orbit really is. I mean, a lot of people don't realize this. I mean, this is why the astronauts appear weightless when they're in orbit. They're only about 200 miles above the surface of the Earth. And at that, at that if, if you were just standing still over the surface of the Earth at that altitude, you'd be almost the same weight you are. You'd be like maybe 90% of your weight. So they're, they're not weightless because they're so far away from the Earth, there's no gravity. An orbit really is falling towards something, just completely uncontrolled falling. But you have enough sideways motion that you keep missing it as you fall toward it. That that's really what an orbit is. Wow. And so you know, same thing with the sun. You know, the the the, you know, the Earth is actually just falling towards the sun, but we have a, a motion of sixty seven thousand miles an hour, which is left over from when we were a spinning disk of material around the sun billions of years ago. And uh, you know, so with that, with that motion that we just have. You know, unless something hits us, we're not going to get rid of it. Uh, you know, we actually just keep missing the sun as we fall toward it. So, so you are actually falling towards this big black hole right now. But, but you are you are going at half a million miles an hour around the Milky Way, left over from the formation of the, the galaxy. 
And uh, and so uh, we, we keep missing it. But but it's kind of cool to think that that's actually something that gravitationally you are bound to right now. So um, let me let me start up some slides and talk about. Please some do. Of the I was going to say, start with the slides. Okay. All right. Let's start with the slides. Boy, impatient here. Okay, so I'm going to share, gonna share, That's share my screen. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, let me share my screen and let me start some slides. All right, so if I start with my first slide of the James Webb Space Telescope, can everybody, can everybody see Webb at this point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, that, that's a, obviously a, 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 an artist conception. We unfortunately have no cameras out there. Um, we thought yeah. about it. We, seriously, we, we, we thought about putting cameras on the web. But um, it was, it's a very difficult environment to put cameras. It's very cold. The operating temperature is 400 degrees below zero. And you know, also, um, the, uh, there wasn't really anywhere very secure on this, uh, on this structure to put it. The, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit how big the mirror is. Um, and it's a very different type of telescope. I mean, normally people are think, think of telescopes as being inside these very long protective tubes that keep out stray light, or in this case, being in space, things like micrometeorites. Uh, the, the mirror is actually just all exposed to, uh, to space. And um, it, was, it was a really audacious mission because the mirror is so big, it, you, you can't fit it in a rocket unless you fold it up first. And um, underneath the mirror in this illustration, if you see my, my cursor, there, there is a, a five layered shield uh, made basically of mylar. It, it's actually a, a technical type of mylar called captain. And, um, but it's just basically as thin as a sheet of, of tin foil. Yeah. And, uh, and then five layers of that protect us from the, uh, the, the heat and the light of, uh, of, of everything else in the universe, the sun, for example, that's just too bright. But let me, um, let me show you a little bit about the web. So here's the size of the web compared to Hubble as far as the mirrors go. Here's one of the astronomers, Sylvia, compared to uh, the Hubble mirror. Hubble mirror is about 2.4 meters uh, across. Wow. Mirror, six and a half meters. <laughs> so um, this is by far the largest space telescope ever launched as far as the mirror size. And um, the size of a mirror is important for two big reasons to astronomers. Uh, one, really simply, you know, a telescope is a big light bucket. The bigger mirror you have, the more light you collect. And that means you can see fainter things and you can take pictures you know, you know, with less time of things that are you know, relatively bright. But there's actually another reason. And um, that other reason, which we'll talk about later when it comes to the big black hole, the bigger your telescope is, the better resolution you get on the sky. Literally, if you think about the size of pixels on an image, the smaller your pixels are. So, so the, the bigger your telescope is, the, the more clear your image is. And so, you know, this is one of the things that we're getting better and better at now is building big telescopes. And, and, and it's not so much just to collect light and see faint objects. The bigger they are, the clarity, the, 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 the sharper the images are. The, um, the, the biggest telescopes we have on ground now, uh, we're building three different telescopes right now on the ground that are on the order of 100 feet across, 30 meter telescopes. And uh, all of those are being built and should go online in the next, I would say, maybe five to 10 years. So I think we're going to see a real, a real revolution in astronomy when that happens. Well, with anyway, the Hubble telescope, how do you, uh -huh. how, uh, this is a much bigger mirror than, than the Hubble. How deep into space, I mean, how does that compare? The Hubble pictures have been amazing. You can see behind me, I have one. Um, right, right. How much further do you think we can go? Oh, I, I, I have the exact answer to that. I'll, I'll show you why. Cool. So. Um, <laughs> Okay, so here's here's the two spacecraft compared, and um, interestingly enough, the, the the spacecrafts are not that different. I mean, I mean, as far as a chunk of of metal, these two uh, objects are not all that different in size. Um, I'm always amazed how big the Hubble Space Telescope is. There, there's a there's a full size replica at the Hubble, both at the Smithsonian in DC and at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And every time I stand next to it, it's, it's the size of a freight cart, you know, cards, it's freight train cards, big. But uh, as you can see, Webb is basically all mirror. <laughs> there, there's, there's nothing, you know, protecting the mirror or covering the mirror up. And so it was a new kind of design where we're using this, this heat shield to keep everything dark. And, and this heat shield is always pointing that the sun and the moon and all of the stuff in our solar system that's very hot and bright always have to be on this side of the heat shield. And then the, the telescope can point out into the dark part of space. And your, your answer about how far away we can see has to do specifically with the type of light that Webb sees, because Webb does not see the same type of light as Hubble. Um, Hubble sees mostly visible light, which is the kind of light that our, our eyes are, are you know, sensitive to. 
uh, Hubble does see a little bit into the infrared, which is a little bit the color a little redder than red, and a little bit into the ultraviolet, you know, the color that's a little bit more violet than violet. So our eyes are only sensitive to this, this sort of small range. Infrared is stuff that's a bit too off the red end for our eyes to see. And uh, the James Webb telescope sees entirely in this infrared light. And so it does not produce any images that your eye could see. Every image that you'll see will actually be something that's processed so that you know, you, you, we'll, have, we'll have beautiful images to show you, but uh, there'll, be, uh, there'll be images that have been processed so you can see the light that would normally be invisible to you. And here's an example of that. So um, this is a famous picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, this was called the Pillars of Creation. It's, it's a part of a, a big nebula called the Eagle Nebula. And um, I mean, not only is this like a dramatic and beautiful image, but when you, when you realize what this is, it kind of, it still gives me goosebumps. So, so the tiniest little bumps, like, like, like take this little tiny lump out here that's kind of floating around. That's much, much bigger than our solar system. So, so all of these yeah. little lumps are probably maybe like five to 10 times the size of our solar system, the, the littlest bumps you can see. And, and that's because inside these clouds, there are actually stars forming at the tip of each of these pillars. And, and stars form, in essence, a star is just a collapsing cloud of, of hydrogen and dust and anything that's in the way. Basically all this hydrogen gas just collapses together under the force of gravity. And um, in the case of the Eagle Nebula, uh, we actually know what's causing these dust clouds to collapse. That's why they're shaped this way. There, uh, there actually was a, a very bright star that exploded that's off the screen <laughs> to the top. And it was a young star that, that probably formed in the same cloud. It exploded and sent off a shock wave. And, and basically it's blowing away the pillars, but, but the tips of these pillars are denser because there are stars forming inside with gravity holding stuff together. So as the rest of the cloud erodes around them, you know, they're actually holding together at the very tip. So that, that's what you're looking at. But, but this is what it looks like when you look in infrared. So, so Hubble did have one instrument that sees just a little bit into the infrared part of the spectrum. And uh, this will give you an idea of what, what we're missing. So these are, these are both real images, not computer generated. So here's the, uh, the visible image. And here is the infrared image coming at you right now. And um, that's real. Wow, okay, that's, totally that's, different. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you think we were <laughs> missing something? Yeah. So, yeah, so, just a little bit. There's some stars <laughs> here, I think. We were missing thousands of stars. Oh, that here. could be galaxies. <laughs> so some of them in the distance are probably galaxies. Yeah. So all of this stuff, all of those stars, the light was obscured by the dust of that nebula. And, so exciting. Um, yeah, it's amazing. And you can actually see, so in, in, the, in the dense columns up here in the infrared, you can actually see the little stars. Like there, there's like two little stars there. That's probably the two stars forming. And there's a cluster of stars here and in there. But um, so you know, infrared allows you to see into places that you normally can't see into. It, 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 the light just comes right on through. It's very good for that. And then as to your question about how far away you can see. Um, so thinking about galaxies, now, um, here's a, a picture of, you know, the, obviously <laughs> a very crude illustration of the Earth. And, you know, a, a long time ago, there was a galaxy, you know, as okay, you can see, right. the, the lights, the, the, the lights and the, the, the stars in the galaxy are giving off mostly blue light. But something happens over time as the universe expands. And this is really important as to why we use infrared light. Space actually, as it expands, and all space is expanding, as space expands, it actually stretches the light going through it. It, in some ways, as simply as this. I mean, if you think about this galaxy, the space is expanding. And as space stretches, the galaxy gets moved away from us. And as you can see, the color of the light is changing. It's turning into a more red colored light. That's because the difference between blue light and red light is just the wavelength of light. And if you stretch blue light out, that, that's red light. So, yeah. so what happens with, with starlight that starts out white light or blue light, as that galaxy over time, as it goes through expanding space and the universe expands, the light gets stretched out, meaning it becomes either red or even infrared, all the way out of visible light into infrared. So infrared can see farther into the universe than visible light can. You're looking through so much expanding space as you look at something very distant in the universe. All of that space is expanding between you and that object. 
And so sometimes the light from that object, which started out as a blue star, will be shifted all the way down into infrared. And so, so that's why we chose infrared light, among other things. There's lots of great reasons. But um, we think that Webb will be able to see so far away. It, for, for us, it becomes more of a time effect than a distance thing. So we, we, we hope to see the universe as it was about 200 million years after the Big Bang. And that's the time the very first stars in the first galaxies were, were forming. And so the, the, the telescope was designed with some very specific scientific questions. And, and one was, what were the first stars and galaxies like? And, and, and we really think we'll be able to see that far back in time. So um, if, if, any of you, if, if, if any of you are not familiar with that concept, I, I think most of you probably are, light only travels at a set speed. It's, it's, it's 186,000 miles per second, but it's, it's, a, it's only that speed that they can't go any faster. So as you look farther and farther away, the light took longer to get to you. You know, the, the, the sun's light takes about eight minutes to travel to us. So you see the sun as it was eight minutes ago in the sky. And uh, if you look at the Andromeda galaxy, which is the nearest big galaxy to us, and you can actually see that with binoculars pretty easily, um, you're looking at the galaxy as it was two million years ago. There's, there's no way you can see the Andromeda galaxy the way it is today, because the light has to travel to us. And so we'll be looking for things that are on the order of 13.56 billion years old, you know, the, 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 appearing the way they were that long ago. So, uh, so that's that that's the answer. We, we know so so Hubble Hubble sort of stops the the visible light era sort of stops about 500 million years after the Big Bang. So we're going for another 300 million years before Hubble. And uh, and that's when a lot of really interesting stuff happens because it's really interesting to see how things change from the pictures yeah. you have from Hubble to the pictures you get with a Webb telescope. The first generation of stars may have been really really strange. Um, we there, there's some evidence that the first generation of stars was nothing like the stars we have today. Um, the stars were probably huge. And um, interestingly enough, and we really don't know what this means yet. I mean, they may have actually also contained a lot of dark matter, because oh, wow. uh, when the universe was when the universe was younger, everything was was denser. The universe was smaller. <laughs> Seriously, it's that simple. Everything was closer together, and so the concentrations of dark matter were also a lot higher. And so these first clouds that collapsed, clouds of hydrogen under gravity, you know, the collapse might have been started by you know local dark matter concentrations and things like that. There weren't any other stars to explode and shock the cloud. So the first generation of stars might have been very, very odd. And um, so we are, we're kind of waiting with bated breath for any type of signal as to what these first stars were like. And, and by the way, the, the majority of the atoms in your body were created by those first stars. Um, I mean, every time a, a massive star dies and explodes in a supernova, it creates some calcium, oxygen, iron, magnesium, sulfur, I mean, all of the elements that, that make us up. But the uh, but supernovas today don't produce the elements in anywhere near the, the, the quantity that this first generation of stars did. So, um, you know, when you think about actually that the atoms in you right now, um, most of them were made in that first generation of stars. That's that's why I we have another to... question for you. That, um, I know yeah. that the permanent location of um, the Webb Telescope is someplace called Lagrange Point, um, absolutely gravitationally stable point in space near Earth. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes, I can. Hey, look at this. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> look at that. Timing is everything. <laughs> okay, so here's here. I can play this this, this animation uh, over. Um, okay, yeah. So 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 why do why do we put Webb where it is? Okay. Um, the Webb telescope uh, is very different from Hubble as far as the orbit. Now, now, Hubble is actually in Earth orbit. It orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. And the Webb telescope instead, um, it's an infrared telescope. And so the Earth, even, even if it's out in space somewhere, the, the Earth is just way, way too warm for it to be around. Um, this telescope, in order for it to last a long time, doesn't have any coolant on it. Like, like I, I used to work on the Spitzer Space Telescope uh, which launched in 2003, and we had a big tank of liquid helium, which is is about um, you know about four degrees above absolute zero, and so we actually used up our helium over the course of the mission. And I mean the mission lasted a long time, but we want Webb to be able to do that without we we can't refill it, we can't go out there and service it. So the telescope is designed to passively cool. Everything is designed to radiate heat out into the universe. 
And uh, because of that, we don't want it anywhere near the Earth and the Moon. And like you said, there's something called a Lagrange point, and there are several of these in our solar system. Now, what a Lagrange point is, it's a place where the gravity of, of, of objects and also the centripetal force of an orbit, the force that keeps you sort of flung out, balance. And so a, a million miles away from the Earth, which is four times farther out than the moon, there's one of these points that's a stable point in gravity. And I'm just kind of keeping playing this so you can see this. Um, L2 is a place where the gravity of the sun and the Earth balance out the centripetal force of the orbit. And it, I mean, it is sort of a mathematical point. We're not, we're not going specifically to that point, but we're getting the, the Webb telescope near that point. So it will just gently orbit around that, that point, actually about uh, every 168 days. It'll just slowly kind of orbit around this gravitational stable point. And the reason we do that is you don't need basically any guidance fuel at all. Gravity and centripetal force just stick it there. And we have other things out there too. This is not the first time we've used L2. Uh, so the number two, of course, means there are other ones. So the, uh, the, the ones that we, we use often, uh, we do have spacecraft at what's called L1. And L1 is the gravitational point between the Earth and the Sun, where the gravity of the two balance. And of course, the, the, the Sun is much more massive than the Earth, so it's much closer to the Earth. But that's L1. L2 is behind the Earth and the Moon being flung out where, where the gravity of our system and the centripetal force balance. And then um, Lagrange point three and four are actually off to the sides of Earth and we have things there too. And then there's another Lagrange point called L5, which is behind the sun. And that one's so close to the sun, we couldn't have anything there that would, that would last. So, so we, and, and, and every planet in our solar system has, uh, has these Lagrange points. So they're, they're just, they're places where gravity and centripetal force balance and they're stable, sort of parking spots. You park a spacecraft there and the combined gravity and forces stick it right there. And it's, it's a really good way to do that. Does, this, does that make sense as to sort of where it does. It I must have the Southern pronunciation of Lagrange. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, you know, it's a French word. So I mean, you could say Lagrange and I don't think anybody would, you know, but I think, I think Lagrange, you know, something yes. so it, <laughs> I knew it was French. That's why I slaughtered yeah. it. So that, that's um, where it is, yeah. And, um, and so that, to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, so, so about that heat shield. So like I said, we, we, we parked it out there because it's away uh, from all of the, the sunlight and earth light. Of course, there's still sunlight out there. It's only you know past the moon. Uh, and so the, the heat shield has to really keep the entire telescope uh, in, in shade all the time. If, if the sun or the earth, were, if that light would ever go down the telescope, it would destroy the instruments. So mm -hmm. we have to make sure that the heat shield is always, so the sun is always over here and the earth and then we all can only look out into space, uh, this direction. But over the course of a year, as we go around the sol uh, go around the, the sun, you know that means you can see, you know, all the entire sky. As long as you look away from the sun over the course of a year, you can see the whole thing. But to give you an idea, it's it's amazing. Um, just those five layers of mylar, the seventy foot uh, uh, shield, amazing. I mean, I mean, pretty pretty big. The uh, the hot side that faces the Earth, and so we've got all of our communication stuff here. You know, all of the, all of the stuff that's radio beaming the data back and forth um, that operates at about 185 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty hot. It's warm. Uh, but the uh, the cold side gets down naturally just by radiating to minus 388 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's um, uh, I know in, in, in Celsius it's it's 40 degrees above absolute zero Celsius. Being a scientist, I, I tend to always go in Celsius. But yeah. but the um, the uh, some of the instruments are actually even a little colder. They're actually even better shielded, and they get down to about four hundred degrees below zero. Oh my God, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, and here's here's how this is what I was losing sleep over. So um, these five layers of mylar, and this is the the actual testing. And this they're real, thin. Yeah, the, this is the real extending of the shield and testing it. Um, so the, the, there's five layers, and, and basically just the, the, just the vacuum of space between them means there's not a lot of heat that goes from one layer to the other. And this had to work. Um, if, if, if this heat shield didn't extend, then we couldn't even turn the damn thing on. I, I mean, it, I mean it, it had to work to get this thing cool enough for the instruments to, to actually see anything. And you know, the instruments were, were designed to, to only be sensitive to this light that is basically heat light. Infrared is often what we think of as heat light at minus 400 degrees below zero. And um, you know, there were times when during testing they tore it and things didn't work. And um, this this is crazy. So to get that damn thing to, 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 to 
you extend and, and tension correctly, there were 140 different release mechanisms, 70 hinges, eight deployment motors. There were bearings and springs and gears, 400 pulleys, 90 cables. It's, it's it, it a was, miracle. I mean, it's it oh. <laughs> and, I mean, so the, every single one of these was a single point failure. There was no redundancy. If a single one of those release mechanisms didn't work, and they were, they were little actuators where you send a current through it, it melts a little wire, a little pin moves away so the thing can extend. If one of those had gotten stuck. <laughs> oh, God. Thank God yes. it worked because now we got pictures coming. And oh, the same thing with the telescope too, because that had to um, unwind as well. I don't know, unfold. Exactly. Is word. So, so here's, here's the telescope. And again, this is an image from testing. So the, the mirror has, is folded up. The sides of the mirror are bent back. And, and so eventually those have to get bent up in front, you know, for the, for the whole co complete mirror. The other thing that has to happen is the secondary mirror, I'm pointing, so that's good. The, 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 the focusing mirror, the, 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 this mirror here, let, let's go back and do that a little more slowly. It's a little fast, that one. So um, the, uh, the, the main mirror is folded up and, uh, and here's the, 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 the mirror that comes out to focus the light on this big long arm, that has to work. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, here they are mounting it to the, uh, the, the shield. There you see the, uh, the test of the, uh, the main uh, wings going out for the telescope. And here we are testing again uh, the heat shield. Yeah, yeah, you can see all the people. My husband was one of these people in a bunny suit there. It's a, be <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it, it, it really is amazing. It's amazing and, uh, engineering. Amazing engineering. And, and not only that, okay, so to give you an idea about how sensitive stuff are, like this has to survive launch. I mean, we have to, this, this has to rattle around on a launch. Um, this is our window into the detectors, and um, you'll notice that there seems to be little black dots on this window. And okay, what are those? Well, let's talk Micro. about the <laughs> <laughs> micro Micro's. shutters. Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, these, each one of these is about the size of a postage stamp. So that's how big about a postage stamp. And each one of these postage stamps has sixty-two thousand tiny little shutters, little mm -hmm. metal shutters that open and close. And, and that's because this is an actual uh, um, um, electron microscope view of, the, of these micro shutters working. Um, these tiny little metal shutters open and close independently, every single one by How electric. Heck did that, how the yep. heck did you guys do that? <laughs> yep. And, and the reason we do that is because is, is you, know, you have lots of stuff on the sky. And you know, here's like sort of a view of the, the telescope. And then mm -hmm. now we can actually close and open the shutters so that we're just looking at the galaxies we're interested in. We, get, 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 we, can, we can do faster observations. We can collect just the light we're looking for. We can do more sensitive things oh. for very small distant objects. So all of this has to survive launch. And so here's, here's, here's testing at Goddard. This, this was, I, I was often on lunch break watching this behind the windows. Uh, here they are putting the mirror together and uh, getting the whole thing stood up. Uh, it is coated with gold. Gold is very reflective. Here's a giant centrifuge, making sure it'll survive the gravity of launch. Uh, then we're going to um, take it and we're going to rattle it to make sure it'll stand the, uh, the vibrations of launch. There we go, rattling it. <laughs> kind of like how they kids. tested the first astronauts. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and the, coming, the, the next one is my favorite way to die in our building. We've got so many ways to die. Um, this is it being put into an acoustic chamber that's going to expose it to uh, about 120 decibels, which is a fatal level of sound. It would kill you. And wow. so uh, this, this is it being exposed to sound vibration so strong it would actually rattle apart your brain. And then we put it into a giant vacuum chamber uh, and uh, this gets it down to 400 degrees below zero. And uh, this is the biggest vacuum chamber we have at NASA. Uh, it was so big that we put entire Apollo command modules with astronauts in them during the uh, Apollo program. And, wow. uh, and there we are. The, the thing to remember is that everything in this telescope is designed to work at 400 below zero. So the curvature of the mirrors isn't right at room temperature because you mm -hmm. know, the mirrors can squirt a little bit under the different temperature. So in, in order to even know if the thing focuses, you need to get it down to operating temperature. It, 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 the whole thing is designed to work in a very different realm than, uh, than our, us humans are, are used to. And then we put it on top of a Roman candle and swing it out of the orbit. Oh, <laughs> it's like it doesn't matter at all. Wow. <laughs> And uh, this, this was actually so much fun. You know, I, uh, I, I couldn't really believe I was seeing this. Um, so the, this, the, the, there was a camera on the rocket. Uh, this, this was the, Euro the main European contribution. They did some instruments too, was the rocket. Uh, the Ariane 5 rocket is a, a European Space Agency rocket. 
and uh, and here is the telescope uh, being let go into space. That, that's that's really the back of the telescope with the Earth in the background, and off it goes uh, on its way out to a million miles away. Um, this, by the way, is where some of the most intense times of my life happened, because uh, the first thing that needs to happen, which you'll see in a few minutes, a few seconds actually, I mean, it, it is that um, we needed to deploy uh, a solar shield, uh, sorry, a solar panel to generate electricity. And then the, uh, the telescope could start to move all these little motors and all these little pulleys. And what you have to remember is that the warmer the telescope is, the easier those pulleys and motors are going to work. So the whole thing now is a bit of a race. It's moving farther and farther away from the Earth and the sun. It's cooling down, naturally. That's good. We want it to cool down. But we want to get all these deployments done before it's too cold and everything seizes up. And the motors did have little heaters on them. But again, we want to have the telescope as warm as possible so that we don't need a lot of energy going to those motors. So the first thing you'll start to see now is the little uh, solar panel going. There we go. Uh, now starts a race. Now we start doing every deployment of those hundreds and hundreds of deployments. And we figured there would be some problem. There'd be some, we'd have to like, you know, send signals a couple times, figure out what was wrong, maybe a software glitch. Everything starts to work perfectly. Uh, okay, do this one. It worked. Great. Go on to the next one. Okay. Okay. Great. That worked too. Okay. We, we're still warm. Go to the next one. Yeah. And, and so, for basically the next 24 hours, we started sending all these commands, and everything started to work perfectly. <laughs> and and that meant we all just kept doing this until we literally fell over. And they told us all just go home and get some rest because <laughs> you know we you know because everything was fine and we were we were deploying and, and the deployments were moving and the pulleys were pulling. And what do you know? And then we came back and it all kept going just fine. And, and, and the launch was absolutely perfect. So wow. here's, what we just, here's what we just finished. So obviously this is an illustration. There's 18 of these mirror segments coated with gold because gold is very reflective in the infrared. Uh, it's only a couple hundred atoms thick of gold. So it's about the equivalent of five wedding rings over the whole telescope. That was also and, difficult to do too. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was just yeah. that. Yeah. Um, this yeah, is yeah. fascinating. I was going to ask you if you were ready to move on to black holes, or if you, oh, you want to move on to black holes. Okay, cool. Yeah, I want to get these questions asked because it's this is all so fascinating to, to everyone. Skip that. Okay, so I'll I'll just say um, before I go to black holes because they're next. Um, here is our first focusing image. That, that that we were just focusing on a star. Uh, it was not a long exposure. We're just making sure everything's in Look focus. Look at all the little galaxies oh, around there. Look at this little thing here. Look at that. So so I mean, this was just a quick exposure, and all of a sudden we we're like, holy cow! Look at that. That's that's not what we said. We we said things. Like I know. Stars. I know what you said. <laughs> yeah. And we said it's it's already picking up these deep you know distant galaxies even even on focusing. Image. Amazing. So, yeah. Okay. 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 Black hole. Right. Now um. A lot of you are aware that we uh, we, we took a, a similar picture of a black hole just a couple years ago. Um, the, the, these are the first two images of uh, that came out of something called the Event Horizon Telescope, and we'll talk about that. And the Event Horizon Telescope is called uh, that it's specifically because the goal of this giant consortium was to be able to take a picture of the event horizon of a black hole. Now, now black holes famously emit no light at all. There's, there's gravitation, the gravitation is so intense that even light cannot escape a black hole. And um, this always, I think, should bother people more than it does. Because when you think about what gravity is, we're used to thinking of gravity as between two things that have mass. You know, the sun is attracted to the earth and the earth is attracted to the sun uh, because of the, the, they both have mass. You are attracted to the earth because you have mass. Um, light doesn't have mass. So how does light get sucked in by gravity? You know, how, how does that happen? Because light shouldn't care. There's no mass to light. Uh, and and the, the real thing that's going on, and this, this I, I hope kind of makes, gives you a little clutch in your throat, is that um, black hole's gravity is so intense, it warps space and time, so that even as the light thinks it's freely flying through space, there's no mass, you know, the, the, the space and time itself are bent into the black hole. So where, where you see the dark part of this image, I know it looks like a bad coffee cup stain. Somebody put, put their coffee <laughs> cup down. But the amazing thing is that in here, in this dark area, we, we don't know what reality is. I, I, I mean that. Um, space and time as we know it don't exist. We, we know that much. And the, that's 
an amazing idea. When when this um, experiment was was announced, say I, I guess maybe 20 years ago they started it, started organizing for it. Um, I didn't think they'd be able to do it. I didn't think you'd actually be able to see the dark part of a black hole. I thought there'd be too much material and gas in the way and all kinds of schmutz. And I was like, you know, really, you're going to try to actually see the dark part of a black hole? Because that's not very large. Event horizons, even for huge black holes, are surprisingly small. Uh, so let, let's talk a bit about this experiment, how they did it. And, um, and so Sagittarius A star is, is not a very uh, wonderful name for the big black hole in the middle of our galaxy. It's in the constellation Sagittarius. Um, the, the Sagittarius, the A, comes from the fact that it was the brightest radio source in the constellation Sagittarius. That's how we discovered it to begin with. Um, there's a lot of um, magnetically, there's, the, there's a lot of charged hot gas around there. And uh, it interacts with magnetic fields to create radio waves. So, you know, fairly early on in, in radio astronomy, we knew there was a big radio bright area. But then the, the star, the asterisk, and that's really what it is. Sagittarius A star is an asterisk, means it's also emitting x-rays. And so it was an area that was emitting all kinds of different light, couldn't see anything there. And, uh, and so, so I'll, I'll give you a little sense of, of, of what this thing is and how we actually came to, to, to take this image. So the, um, the middle of the Milky Way is about 27,000 light years away from us. Uh, we live sort of on the edge of the galaxy, uh, edge of one of the spiral arms. The Event Horizon Telescope is not just a single telescope, but actually more than eight observatories. And these observatories are all around the world. Uh, as you can see here, there's some in Hawaii, there's some on the mainland of the United States, there's some in Mexico, uh, Chile, there's one, in, there's one at the South Pole, uh, there are some in Europe, and there's, there's one up in, uh, in Greenland. And th there are other uh, telescopes now that we'll, we'll be adding to this. And the, uh, the incredible thing is, the, in, in some ways it sounds simple. All of these telescopes, we're going to look at the black hole at the same time. And remember that we were saying that the bigger your telescope is, the wider it is, the clearer an image, the smaller the pixels you get. And, and that's really important for looking at these, uh, these dark areas of black holes, because um, the, the first one that they released an image of was of the M87 galaxy. I'll show you a picture of that one too to remind you. And the M87 galaxy is 50 million light years away. Okay, so, so that, that's how far away that galaxy is. And the size of the event horizon of the black hole is ab about the diameter of the orbit of, of Neptune around the sun. Oh. And so you're, you're trying to see something that's the size of the orbit of Neptune from 50 million light years away. And so you need very clear, <laughs> very small pixels for to see that. And uh, so the idea is have all these telescopes work together to look at it at the same time. Uh, this is what the M87 galaxy looks like. Uh, the reason we thought there was a big black hole in there is this giant jet. This jet is about 80,000 light years across. Uh, superheated material is being blasted away, not from inside the black hole. Nothing comes from inside the black hole. But, but as stuff tries to cram itself down the black hole, there's this whirlpool of superheated billion degree gas. And that generates a huge magnetic field. And some of that, that, that charged hot gas gets burped out uh, along the, the pole of that magnetic field. So these, these big jets, like I said, nothing comes from inside the black hole, but they're from very intense regions around the black hole. There's another little picture of that from 50 million light years away. And, and here's the image of the black hole. So this was the first time we actually saw that gaping maw. There's a hot disk of gas all around the black hole. And, and, and in the middle there, you see nothing. And, and that's the area where no light is coming from because space and time are bending back on themselves, literally. Now, um, if you want to find out exactly what this is, uh, um, so I should mention, the, the dark area is slightly larger than the event horizon itself. And it, it's actually for a, a surprisingly simple reason, but it, it's, it's kind of hard to visualize. The, the black hole absorbs light in all directions. It's not like a, 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 you know, water going down a drain just going down. It absorbs in, in all directions at once. And so don't worry, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you, the black hole is actually absorbing light from the back side, the side we can't see, the side, the side that's away from us. And that actually causes a, a bigger, what we call a shadow, because some of the light coming in, even at a high angle above the black hole, gets absorbed in the back. And so 
it actually creates this thing we call the shadow, which is about one and a half times the size of the event horizon. And if you want to hear more about that, there's a really good short lecture on YouTube by this guy, Derek Muller. Here's me fangirling him at the White House. <laughs> and uh, we, were, we were invited to give talks uh, back when people had scientists at the White House. But anyway, <laughs> um, Derek Muller uh, does a podcast called Veritasium. And if you want to really, it, it's only an eight minute long little film, but he goes through all the steps about what that dark area really is. So look, look up Veritasium black hole and you'll find it, Derek Muller. So you, you'll see him. And um, so like I was saying, we live here on the outskirts of one of the spiral arms of the galaxy. This is where the sun is, right in the middle there. And uh, the, the black hole is about 27,000 light years away in the very middle of our galaxy. We don't think that's a coincidence. We think galaxies form around big black holes. And um, we, we've never been able to see it before because it's actually quite difficult to look in towards the middle of our galaxy. And um, part of that is there's so much stuff in the way. Uh, so this is another galaxy seen edge on. This is the middle of the galaxy. And you know we live about, about here, about 27 light years out from the middle. There's all of this dust and debris in the disk of a galaxy. You can see it really well in this example. And so if we're here looking into the middle of our galaxy, there's lots and lots of, of dust and gas and nebulas. It's very hard to see in there. We're, we're not really used to thinking about living in a smoke ring, but we really are. And uh, this is actually, sorry, good question. I was gonna say, just to quickly interrupt, this is just like the black nebula in the books. That yeah, the it's a whole, the whole galaxy, the whole plane of our galaxy is full of that stuff. It's it also reminds me of a sink with the water in a cyclonic rotation. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. The black galaxy in the stories is, is it looks like, a, they call it the worm. This is in the books in the Atlantis Grill. So this is ah. literally what, that, that's like, wow. <laughs> this is so cool. Thank you. It is really right, cool. other stuff, yeah. <laughs> if, if you look in the direction of the black hole, you're looking through the disk of our galaxy. And this is what you see in the sky. Uh, so this is that, that area of Sagittarius. You see a lot of black dust. This is the black stuff is all dust. Every single little tiny grain there is a star. <laughs> There's lots of stars between us and the Hard middle of the galaxy. Yeah. Oh, um, this all got uh, a lot easier on the mission that I was working on at Caltech uh, called the Spitzer Space Telescope. So Spitzer sees heat light, infrared light, and the heat light gets through that dust, just like we saw with that nebula with Hubble. And so we started to take images of what was going on in the middle of the galaxy with heat light. And things, things were much clearer because we could see through the dust. And um, this is an infrared image, a heat image of the very, very core of the galaxy. So this, this bar is six light months long. Wow. The, the, the nearest star to us is four light years away. In the middle of the galaxy, you've got thousands of stars all packed into that area. And in the, in the 90s, and I was actually doing a little bit of this in my graduate years, we started doing infrared uh, observations of what these stars were doing in the middle of the galaxy. And this is very, 92, look at that. So th this is a real image. It, it's blurry and the pixels are big, but this is actually the data that we took. Um, we saw all the stars over the course of a couple years orbiting around something. And these are stars bigger than the sun. And they're all orbiting around where this, this sort of yellow crosshair is, but there's nothing there. And we were like, well, wait a minute. In order to get stars to do that, something really big has to be there. Because <laughs> these, are, these are stars orbiting around like planets. Wow. And uh, it, indeed, this, was a, this is a graphic. This is based on the data. So th th this is really what stars were doing. And, and this particular one I love, it gets whipped around this, this object that there's nothing there. And it ends up going, this is true, it ends up going over 20 million kilometers an hour as it does that. Wow. This star is in an orbit around a thing. And here you, here you see this little odometer, it's gonna get whipped around again. It's gonna go up to 20 million kilometers an hour, a star. What could do that? <laughs> hey, guess what, a giant black hole. <laughs> so we, we, we knew something was there. Uh, and now for the first time, the Event Horizon Telescope has actually imaged it. And I just wanna give you an idea of how big the Event Horizon is. So um, like I said, this is matter, well, started, started as matter, it's not matter anymore. This is now this kind of bottomless hole of space and time. And the Event Horizon is not a solid surface. It's just the area that if you go any closer to it, time and space don't exist. 
Um, as far as we know, uh, time stops at the event horizon. And that this was something my husband worked on. That's confirmed by the star. You sort of mentioned this, that, that as, oops, come on, do the, do the thing. No, it's not gonna do the thing. Good thing. Sometimes you gotta, there we go. As, as the star goes around the black hole, um, it actually gets close enough to it that its time slows down. Um, we, we can measure that. And uh, that's, that's incredible. Uh, so it's only a, a relatively small shift, but the other thing that's going on is that the black hole is actually warping space and time itself. So it's orbit down here, and we've observed this, it's really weird because it's going through warped space and time. So we actually see the black hole slow the time down as the star gets closer and farther away. At the event horizon, time as we know it stops. And all bets are off as to what happens inside the event horizon. I, I mean that. It's, it's a place where space and time don't exist the way we perceive them. Um, the Sagittarius A uh, event horizon is about 17 times the diameter of our sun. And inside there is the mass of 4 million stars. Now, the, the way a black hole gets mass is when stuff falls in, the mass stays in there. And the, the, the more mass a black hole has, the bigger that event horizon moves out. And we do think eventually, pretty much everything in the universe will fall down black holes. So you are, you are very likely looking at where your atoms will end up eventually. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a very stable orbit around the black hole, but over trillions of years, um, the, 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 the most likely scenario is that your atoms will end up going down this thing. And uh, here is the, uh, the black hole sort of compared to uh, the, uh, the other one that we saw. This is M87 on this side. So that, that's the one that's uh, 50 million light years away. The M87 one is about 5 billion times the mass of the sun. So it has a bigger event horizon. So here's the, uh, you know, here's the event horizon. So you see here, I, I guess, I, okay, I lied. Pluto's orbit's a little smaller. So in the, in the M87 black hole, uh, Voyager 1 is about to the end of that event horizon now, if you were there. It's a little bit bigger than Pluto's orbit. And here's Sagittarius A, the one in our galaxy. And as you can see, it's about, uh, uh, it's, it, it would all fit inside Mercury's orbit. Yeah, so there's the sun's diameter. So it's, much, so it's, a, it's a much smaller black hole, but you know, four million times the mass of the sun isn't too shabby. And just to yeah. compare the two, uh, here's here's the here's Sagittarius A compared to uh, uh, the M87. So Sagittarius wow. A, would be wow, quite a oh my smaller. god, <laughs> yeah, yeah, M87 isn't the biggest one we know of either. Anyway, um, I have more stuff I can show you, but I'll, I want to make sure you guys have plenty of time for some questions, and yeah. uh, and then yeah, so. And I'm going to ask, uh, there's been a couple of questions um, that have come up. I'm going to either come back to those or ask you to answer them via email, if you would. We'll just post yeah, them. Sure. Um, I do want to know um, what inspired you to become an astronomer and a research scientist, and how would you get there? And what advice can you give other young women who are thinking about pursuing that career choice? The, um, there's not a great answer for how I became interested in astronomy because I don't ever remember not being interested in astronomy and I don't know why. <laughs> um, when, when, I, um, when I moved to JPL, uh, so I, I did a postdoc at Caltech and I got a, uh, a job at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, that was back in the 90s when they still had uh, paper uh, phone books. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I want to look at my name. My name's in the JPL phone book. Look at that, look at that. And I, I opened it up and, and, and there, there were two other Thalers in there. And Thaler's not a very common name. And so I called these people up and it wasn't too long that we established the connection. Um, so they, they were both related to me. I'd never met either of them, but one of them was my grandparents' cousin's kid. And we, we figured it out. It wasn't that long in the past. And so something about being interested in space almost seems to run in my family. My, my mom said that when I could walk, I was trying to get out and look at the stars and she could not figure out why, because she thinks there are lights in the sky. Why would you possibly be interested in that? Um, I have just always loved it. And I've just sort of fought against a culture that said that people like me aren't the right personality to be a scientist. Um, science is often presented as very difficult. You know, oh yeah, multivariable calculus. Oh yeah, I can do that. Well, the thing is, there's nothing difficult about multivariable calculus if you learn it a little bit at a time in a non-confrontational way. It's like, you know, you wouldn't say to somebody, you know, you're, you're, you're so dumb, you could never learn Spanish. I mean, most people can learn Spanish if they try. 
And, you know, some people are better at it than others. Some people are great at languages. Some people are not great. But I don't think there's anybody that can't learn some Spanish. And, and, and math and physics are the same way. And so I just kind of refuse to leave. I mean, that, that, that's really what happened. <laughs> Um, you know, I, in there. I, I did not get good grades. Uh, well, I, I mean, I got good grades in high school, but then in college, I was blown out of the water. I, I realized later that coming from kind of a rural public school, uh, I went to, to Harvard. Yeah, I, I, I was, I was, I, the people were, were years ahead of me. They had far more experience than I did. And, and, you know, opening, opening day in physics, they were doing math I'd never seen. So, I mean, I, I just got bad grades and then kept going back. And, and, I mean, this was, ego destroying and, and and I'm not, it did a lot of damage. I've done therapy about this. I, um, it, it's not the way to learn being scared and, and not being confused. And it does not have to be that way. And so I'm, I'm really totally kind of, that's, the, that's a culture of science. Yeah. It's not the topic. You know, like I said, I mean, they, they, they try to give you this, this sort of big uh, mind fuck part you know, is, is, you know, oh my God, you have to be so smart to be a scientist. It's like, it, it is the same as learning a language. And and anyone can do it to, to be to be functional. I am not I myself to mathematics that way because exactly. I had a lousy teaching situation, and of course you were discouraged. So right. I can really um, identify. So I guess um, you, uh, the other thing is, you know, I, I'm not particularly good at being a really detail oriented scientist. I mean, I, I was good enough to get a doctorate. I enjoyed my research program. You need people with different skills. Yeah. There are some people that are really good at the nitty gritty calculus, and there are some people that are really good at saying, hey, geometrically, what are we looking at here? And they're more of a, of a large picture group. people. Yeah. So I'm more the big picture person. And, and so on the team, I'm always like, hey, guys, it's obvious. Let's, 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 it, these, these things connect. And other people are like, wow, I didn't see that, but I can't, I can't do the details as well. So there are lots of ways to be a scientist, lots of ways to be part of a research team. And I think that the whole idea is people often say to me, it's like, so how do I get to be the right personality to be a scientist or to be, to work at NASA or to be a leader? And the answer is you start with the personality you have and that's not going to change. You know, that, that, that's you, but, but, but find a place for you to fit in. And then that's Extroverts why I'm, do fit in. Oh, I'm, I'm a total introvert. It's, and I'm totally an extrovert, but I'm just saying extroverts will fit in. Extroverts fit in. Introverts fit in too. I oh, um I see more introverts. <laughs> people people think this is crazy because I do a lot of camera work. Um, a lot of people that are actors and people that are on camera are introverts. Mm -hmm. Um, there's there's something about the I think the energy and and the you know that we put into speaking that that the people respond to because because it's not easy for me. I actually had, I had a stammer as a child, and uh, and so speaking is something that takes effort for me. And I think that I, you know, choosing my words and choosing the energy I put into speaking, you know, I, I, I don't like crowds. Um, I, I usually I find places to hide when I'm at conferences and conventions. Um, I'll be at Awesome Con. I'll be at Comic Con this year. You, be, you better believe the first thing I'll be looking for is where to hide. Um, <laughs> I, I love people. I love meeting people. And then I need to go hide for a while. And then I can come back for a while. Michelle, I just wanted to say that I've noticed the way you describe things is just so clear and memorable. It's one yeah, of the yeah. things that just stay with you. Like whatever you explain things, you understand them. I, I I tend to understand them better when I hear you say them. So just thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for what, what you you're, did. If you're, if you're ever working on some concept for one of your books and you want to know about you know, uh, you know, you want to know about dark matter or dark right. galaxies or something. You, you just let me know, and I, I, I think you and I can so talk much. together because <laughs> it's incredible. Like just hearing you explain these things, are just they come alive. They really, really do. So it's just amazing. It's, it's just it's also simple. I mean, I, I, they, 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 they want to make it complicated. It's a rocket science. <laughs> oh Lord, yeah. <laughs> you know, I um. The, the one thing that I kind of want to end on, because I, I know that, you know, with, with all of you, you're, you're, you have huge imaginations. And, you know, looking at the event horizon, and even though it looks like, like someone puts a coffee cup down, the, you're, we are really looking at something we don't understand. Um, we, we do not have physics for. And, um, you know, matter, energy, time, space don't exist the way we perceive them inside a black hole. And um, the other thing that I, I don't know if any of you guys have, have had this thought while we were talking, um, okay, linking telescopes together. So you get a huge telescope. That it's all, they're all linked together. So the telescope is effectively the size of the earth. Why don't we do that all the time? Sounds great. <laughs> um, it's really, really, really hard. To get and, the um, telescope time? 
Well, not to get telescope time. So, so I mean, linking two telescopes is not as simple as just having binoculars. Um, what what you need to do is a technique called interferometry, and I and I can talk about this at length, but I I, I know I only have like five minutes left. Are you guys a hard out? Everybody has to leave at uh, three. I think we have to be because we got other yeah. stuff going we, on. Unfortunately, we got. That's why we want to give you this. Exactly. <laughs> we need another hour for her. We need another <laughs> hour or more. <laughs> let me um let, let me let me end on this because I think you'll like this. Um, this is a, a technique that um, a lot of people. So don't really want to think about how it works. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, in order for a telescope to be linked this way, um, things need to be adjusted to extreme precision. So this was actually my husband's specialty. And I wanna end with a little bit of an explanation from him about this. Um, you need to link things to an accuracy that, it, that is it's stupidly difficult. I mean, I, I did not think they'd be able to do this. And the reason it needs to be linked so accurately is that every single telescope all around the world has to catch the same particle as of light that left the star. Now, that, that's how they exist as one telescope. Every single telescope has to do the quantum mechanics to guarantee they capture the same particle of light from the star. Now, there's, there's eight telescopes that made that image, which means that that particle of light existed in eight places at once. Oh That's my interesting. God. <laughs> <I can't. laughs> right? Now, this may be, some people say this is proof of the multiverse. Some people say otherwise, but, but it really is this odd. And, and to give you an idea, um, my husband was a very conservative uh, um, you know, engineer and he didn't like a lot of imagine. He was, he was a fan of Tolkien, but I wanted to play uh, a little bit of, of his voice. Um, he and I were sitting uh, actually in our yard by our hot tub being uh, recorded by NPR, and I try to get him to talk a little bit about about really what th this is. So let me uh, let, let me just play this last little bit, and then, then I'll end. And and you get nothing. So you get this big or nothing, big or nothing. So uh, th th this is this is part of a podcast that I can link you to. So we're going we're coming in the middle of the podcast. So out of your out of your two waves, yeah. See, so you right, like yes. to interfere with itself yes. because the waves will either add together yes. or they'll cancel each other out. Yes. And you can use the technique to actually trick two telescopes yes, to think to, they're, to one, think big they're one big telescope. But then you go and you say, but ah, light is not necessarily just a wave. Light is in fact also a particle it is. So the thing that gets kind of weird here is that somehow you need to make a single particle of light. Yes, a photon, a single photon. Go through two, two, two different telescopes, two telescopes at once. at the same time, yes. Okay. <laughs> and they, those telescopes can be really long way apart, half a mile apart, right? And how do you get the, the photon to go through both of those telescopes together? This is something that we've talked about because, you know, I mean, one of the things that I, I love about you, you're a very careful scientist and you're on, you're on the conservative side. You don't like, like yeah. going down these weird, you know, leaps of reason that I sometimes love myself. Yeah. But, you know, people have interpreted this result in a number of kind of mind blowing ways because there's a single particle of light that left a star many, many trillions of miles away. Oh, yeah. And, and years ago. And yeah. yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. And the thing is, is that somehow that single particle of light does in fact go through both telescopes at the same time. Yes. And it truly does. Because if it didn't, <laughs> it wouldn't work. So here's the problem, right? I mean, I mean your instruments do you, they, you, do they, work, they actually yeah. you actually do get this they light really, really to go through work, it. You actually yeah. do get your your, right. your data out of that. Yeah. So some people have interpreted this, and I I, I kid you not as this being an example of parallel universes of different yes. realities. Yes, the multiple that, universe. Idea. The multiple universe, that there's yes. a universe, there's a reality where the light went through one of your telescopes and there's a reality where the light went through the other telescope. Mm -hmm. And your result requires those universes to kind of be fuzzy. Yes, and overlap a little bit. To kind of overlap a little bit. Yeah, right. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't like it. <laughs> you know, well, what you've offered in response to that, which I think is also lovely, is yeah. you said, okay, we live in a universe where very strange things happen. Yes. We, we, we simply live in a universe where a particle of light can be two places at once. Yes. And can actually interact with two different telescopes at the same time. That's right. That's right. Yes. And that, you know, that's what the mathematics of quantum mechanics says. But it's not satisfying. I mean, I'm thinking of the time you were working in Hawaii. <laughs> so, you know, we're now at the point in our technology where we are futzing with possibly parallel realities. And like I said, my, my husband didn't like that particular explanation, but what he liked better was that we have no idea what space and time really are. 
and we live in a universe where it's much more complex than we know. And uh, and as you know, you know that's that's something I'm 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 doing better than I was last year. I'm working through my grief because my, my husband died about 18 months ago, and uh, you know, he's still he's still you know with me on this journey. And uh, but you know. One of the things that we, we we never really believed in space and time anyway. So I, I don't so much think I'll ever see him again, but I, I think I'm still with him in the life that we had. And that moment is as real as any other. And we really are, and I'm happy to talk with you here more about this if you'd like. We really are at a point in our technology where we're, we're starting to mess with structure of reality. It's just mind blowing. This is- It is mind blowing. It's like, seriously, it's Thank scary. You so <laughs> Thank you so much. Please, you, please, Michelle. please come back next year. We always enjoy it. And I was going to please say, Michelle, may I send you my books? Because I don't want to be like the person who, oh, here you go. It's like, they're big. So would it be oh, okay? Great. In other words, oh, sure. would you like copies of them? Because there's four big books. I, was about to, I, I, I can buy them. I can get yeah, buy them. No, no, well. no, no, no. I was just saying, because I don't want to clutter your house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd be honored, Vera. I really would. I would love to, because just just to, in case you're curious. So. <laughs> I'm gonna you. I'm gonna cut in and remind everybody that the next um, session is the blue trivia quiz, and this oh. is really cool. And remember, if you compete and you're the top five, you get into the grand uh, the finals round on Sunday. So thank you again. <laughs> great time, uh, Nancy. Thank to you, Gert, Michelle. Sarah, to get a hold of you to get those links. Thank so you. Great. Such a great. Don't, 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 don't trust reality. It's not what you think. <laughs> I never reality did. Reality is only a state of mind. Exactly. exactly. Thank you. Anyway, right. well, goodbye. Bye-bye.